Hi, this is Frank Taylor with Nature at Your Door, <laughs> and I really am at my door. And I can't tell you how many episodes have started right here. You know that the purpose of my channel is to engage people in exploring outside, just outside their door and finding nature that's around you. And I found some serious nature right here. And again, just like that black widow spider was at my back door, today, let me show you what I found at my door. You're not going to believe this. I'm really not making this up. Right here at my door this morning is a woolly bear caterpillar. I can't believe it. It's really right here. And this is going to be the focus of my next episode. So after I found this woolly bear caterpillar literally at my door, I did some research on him and then did some filming. So here's the results of my research and my films. There are five things that I want you to know about this. First, I want you to know about his scientific name and what it means. I love breaking down the scientific names. The second thing I want you to know is it's found in Arctic regions. How many butterflies or moths are found in Arctic regions? That'll explain how and why it can survive there. It's a great story. Number three, I'm going to tell you why we see them so often in the fall, especially here in the United States and throughout the country, crossing roads. What's up with that? Fourth thing I want to tell you is how they became one of the most famous caterpillars in the country. And they even have festivals, woolly bear festivals in honor of this caterpillar and how it came about to predict winter weather. Hmm. And lastly, I want to address, hey, I thought hairy caterpillars stink. So this will be the fifth thing. Do woolly bears sting? Can they sting? What are the facts on woolly bear caterpillars? So stay tuned. I think you're going to like this episode. Right here in your backyard, you never know what you're going to find. And there's a make this invasive. There's a top. Dogwoods are flowering. And I just took a couple swipes of terrestrial environment. Uh, produce seed pollen. And it's... So fact number one, this caterpillar that I found is known as the banded woolly bear. And it comes by a lot of names. In the south of the United States, a lot of times they call it a woolly worm. Another name I've heard for it is the hedgehog caterpillar. Because when it feels it's in danger, it rolls up into a ball like a hedgehog and just spreads out its bristles and spines. The scientific name of this caterpillar is Pyrarctica Isabella. Pyrarctica Isabella. I struggle with scientific names, but I love teaching about them. So if we break down the name, the first part of the name, Pyre, means fire. The second part of the name, Arctica, means Arctic. So this is the fire caterpillar, and it gets its name because of the bright, bright red that you can see on its uh, body. In Arctic, because it occurs in the Arctic regions as well. The scientific name species of Isabella refers to the color Isabella, which is like a gray yellow. And the adult of this species is called the Isabella tiger moth. Fact number two. This moth caterpillar is found in Arctic regions. How is that possible? What is it that enables this caterpillar to live in Arctic regions? Well, number one, the first thing is, is the food it eats. I'm not in uh, an Arctic region right now, but I'm in my backyard. I'm looking at this grassy area because this is a place that a woolly bear caterpillar could find lots of food. For example, it'll eat dandelion leaves like this. It will eat plantain leaves like this. It'll eat some of the grasses. It'll eat this clover. So it can eat a lot of different things. Some butterflies are very specific to eating one kind of tree or one kind of leaf or one kind of, of plant, like monarch butterfly caterpillars. Monarch caterpillars will only eat milkweed. So these caterpillars will eat just about anything. They do feed on some tree leaves like birches and maples and elms, 
but they're pretty happy just eating things that are growing on the ground, even grasses. So in the tundra, where there's no trees at all, they can find things to eat even on the tundra. So how is it that these caterpillars can survive in the tundra where they have very, very long winters and very short growing seasons where green plants are out and doing photosynthesis? They have cryoprotectants in their body that allows them to be frozen up to 90 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. It's incredible. So that cryoprotectant protects the interiors of many, many of the cells inside that organism. Woolly bear caterpillars have been found frozen in pieces of ice and thawed out and they survive. So they're able to survive in these harsh conditions in the tundra. And the other thing they can do is they don't go through their whole life cycle up there in one growing season. Sometimes it takes 14 years for the woolly bear caterpillar to emerge as an adult because they'll grow uh, during a summer, they'll eat, the winter comes back, they'll uh, freeze up for the winter, thaw out the next spring. They have to go through six molts and it takes them sometimes 14 years in extreme Arctic conditions before they go through their final molt and are able to pupate. So in this part of Virginia, like other parts of the country, we see woolly bears a lot at this time of the year. And why is that? It's because they're leaving these meadow areas, these grassy areas or herb layer areas, and they need to find a place to overwinter. So where are these woolly bears going? Well, they're going to places like this, where they can climb underneath and get underneath some leaves and bark and branches or get underneath a log like this one so that they'll be protected from winter weather and extreme conditions and cycles of freezing and thawing. The Isabella tiger moth will actually go through two generations a year and it's that last generation that we see crossing roads and sidewalks that is looking for a place to spend the winter and in the spring, when they emerge, that caterpillar that overwintered will start feeding on plants that it can find, and then it will pupate. And it's that generation that leads to laying eggs in the middle of the summer that results in the caterpillars that we're finding at this time of the year. Here's the fourth thing I want to tell you about. This is a special shout out to the students at Cornwall Central Middle School. Now, I know you guys get to watch my program when you've done good work and you've worked hard during your study period. So and the reason I'm bringing you guys up is because the woolly bear caterpillars became famous because of the visits of a naturalist to Bear Mountain State Park, just a few miles from your school. So national notoriety of the woolly worm caterpillar came about because of Dr. Curran's study of woolly worms at Bear Mountain State Park. Dr. Curran was the curator of insects at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, one of the most famous institutions of natural history in the world. Dr. Curran had heard that people uh, for a long, long time, really since colonial times, we're predicting winter weather by the amount of black and amount of red on a caterpillar. The folklore is the more black there is, the colder and harsher the winter. The more red there is, the milder the winter is going to be. And the colonists started doing this when they first started to build roads and saw these caterpillars crossing the roads. There was no National Weather Service back there, and the colonists needed to know and wanted to know the weather so they knew when to harvest crops or when to plant crops. And so they went to look at the woolly worm for a prediction, and they started using the woolly worms to predict what kind of winter weather they have and whether it would be long or short winter. So Dr. Curran wanted to find out if there was any truth to this folklore. So he left New York City with a group of friends and associates, and mostly friends, and went to Bear Mountain State Park 
and collected 15 caterpillars. There was a reporter with them from the New York Herald Tribune. Dr. Curran went out, collected caterpillars with his friends and the reporter, and they actually found 15 caterpillars. And he measured and documented the amount of red and the amount of black, and he made a winter weather prediction based on that. Well, the national news picked up this story, and for eight years, Dr. Curran went back every year with his friends and looked at woolly worms. And they called themselves the original society of the friends of the woolly worm. And he made it sound like it was like a real science enterprise, but it was really, he just wanted to go up to Bear Mountain, New York, and see the change of the leaves and the colors of the leaves every year and get a chance to leave New York City. So like so much we've seen on our program, there's a lot of variability in biology and there's a lot of variability in the colors on woolly bears. In fact, each time woolly bears molt, they gain more red and lose black. So if you see a woolly bear with a lot of black on it, it may just mean that he hasn't finished molting. He hasn't gotten to that sixth molt yet. So I really hate to disappoint. I feel like I'm being a party pooper. There's just no scientific data to back up the winter weather predictions of the woolly bears. But it is fun to look at them and make your own prediction based on what colors you see. And the fifth, I'll call it factor fancy, is do woolly worms sting? We know that a lot of hairy caterpillars can sting. Do woolly worms sting? I always caution people, don't touch hairy caterpillars. There's many species of hairy caterpillars, and usually the hairs are there to protect the caterpillar from getting eaten by predators. Some of the caterpillars have very severe stings. Some can cause a rash and, and dermatitis. And so the question is, does this particular caterpillar species, can it sting? And the answer is that <laughs> It might bother some people, but not others. And you can see that it has very stout bristles, but none of these bristles are actually venomous. And in fact, even when I pick him up, and I'll take a piece of paper like this and slide the caterpillar underneath and pick up the caterpillar with that. And once I've done that, I'll put him in my hand. So even with woolly bear caterpillars, I use a degree of caution. I have not gotten a skin rash from it, but some people are sensitive, just like some people are very sensitive to poison ivy, and other people are not so sensitive. Some people could be sensitive to the irritation created by these bristles. And these bristles, again, are there to protect him from predators. It's time to let this woolly bear get back out and get on his way and here he goes i always release any organisms that i keep to film right back close by or in the exact spot where i found them thanks for watching this episode if you enjoyed the program please subscribe if you haven't already and give me a like if you have any questions i love interacting with my viewers please leave question or comment and i'll get back to you as soon as i can thanks for watching let's see you in the next episode